everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, the only podcast which is devoted to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, SignalR, and not forgetting the .NET Core community itself. I am your host, Jamie Gabrogman Taylor, and this is episode one, a brief history of .NET Core. In this episode, I'll take you through an incredibly brief history of .NET Core, talk a little bit of how it relates to .NET Framework, and cover the important events of Microsoft's recent history. So let's sit back. Open up a terminal, type in .NET New Podcast, and let the show begin. Essentially, I've been writing about .NET Core at the time of recording for almost two years, and I'm a bit kind of obsessed with it, really. I really like .NET Core. I really like .NET Framework, but .NET Core is the way to be, I think. It's the future, I feel. I'm not a Microsoft employee. I just want to say that right off the bat. I'm just a developer in the .NET Core community who is passionate about .NET Core and wants to spread the knowledge. The reason I started this podcast is because back when I was getting into .NET Core, there was hardly anything out there. I mean, Microsoft had been fantastic at setting up docs.microsoft.com. That's D-O-C-S dot Microsoft.com. You can go there and learn all about .NET Core. You can go to the Microsoft Virtual Academy, the mva.microsoft.com. They've got loads and loads of courses that you can take for free, where you sit and watch videos and do the multiple guest questions at the end. There's a massive community for .NET Core on Twitter as well. If you search for hashtag netcore or hashtag ASPNetCore, seriously, it's worth doing a Google Bing search. However, most of the resources weren't around when I started my journey in .NET Core, which, incidentally, is the name of my blog, .netcore.gabrogman.com. I had to learn .NET Core, ASP, .NET Core, and all the others the hard way. That is, I'm an auditory learner, so I don't take in as much when I'm reading documentation compared to when I'm listening to someone speaking about the same thing. But what I thought I'd do for this first episode is talk a little bit about the history of both .NET Framework and .NET Core. So I'm not going to be as detailed as, say, Richard Campbell, who is, at the time of recording this episode, reportedly writing a book on the history of .NET. This is just going to be a brief overview to get you around the idea of what's .NET Core, how does this relate to .NET Framework, and what's this thing called .NET Standard, and all of these kinds of common questions. As a reminder, I do write about .NET Core over at .NET and I've already written an article about the history of .NET Core. So if you want to read a long-form version of this podcast, then head over there and take a look. As with a lot of the stuff I write on my blog, it's a bit of a long blog post. It currently stands at 1,762 words, and that's the short version. And there's a lot of information on there. I'll put a link in the show notes along with everything else I mention, so remember to check them at .netcore.show. Anyway, let's get started on a brief history of .NET Core. In around 2000 to 2002, Microsoft released version 1 of the .NET Framework. The .NET Framework was a wonderful collection of APIs designed to help with rapid application development that were specific and applicable to the Windows operating system only. I'll quote Wikipedia's article on RAD. Rapid application development, or RAD, is both a general term used to refer to adaptive software development approaches, as well as the name for James Martin's approach on rapid development. In general, RAD approaches to software development put less emphasis on planning and more emphasis on adaptive process. Prototypes are often used in addition to or sometimes in place of design specifications. So the idea is that you rapidly create a prototype using existing libraries of code to help you fill in the gaps. This can help you get from a basic design up to a working application as quickly as possible. You generally go back and refactor parts of the system. That is, once you have it up and running and have enough of it that satisfies the business needs. In order to do RAD, you have to have a library which can facilitate database connectivity and that it has unit testing frameworks built in and that can do XML serialization and a whole bunch of other shopping list items. Well, that's what the .NET framework does. It was, and still is, amazing. The current stable release of .NET Framework, as I record this, in July 2018, is version 4.7.2, and it is absolutely fantastic. 
If you have a Windows server, you can write an application in .NET Framework 4.7.2, throw it at that server, and the server will run it without a problem. What about people like me who use the Ubuntu operating system or Apple hardware? Uh, that is, I have a PC running Ubuntu Mata and a MacBook Air. What do we do? Well, in around 2004, a very, very smart engineer called Miguel de Acasa, I've probably butchered the pronunciation of his name, I do apologize. Anyway, uh, he started a project called the Mono Project. This was an attempt at making a cross-platform black box re-implementation of the .NET framework, specifically for Linux devices. A black box re-implementation of something is when you don't see the actual source code, but you re-implement the source code from the available documentation. For instance, you might have some documentation which says this method called add takes in a number and gives you a different number out. So you might throw a 3 at that method and get out the number 7. You might give it a 9 and get 13 out. So you sit back and think about what the method could possibly be doing to the inputs to get those particular outputs. In my horribly contrived example, the core thing that the add method is doing is that it's adding 4 to whatever value you give it. So my re-implementation of this method might take a value, add 4 to it, and return this new value. And that's essentially what Miguel and his team did, but with the entire .NET framework. And they built an entirely open source black box re-implementation of the .NET framework in C++ for the Linux kernel. And then they ported it to Mac OS and Windows. Which was interesting because you could have the .NET framework and Mono installed on your Windows machine and get different performance stats out of your app depending on whether you run it on .NET framework or on Mono. Now, the important thing to remember here is that at this point, the .NET framework was written in C and C++, but was primarily aimed at developers who used C Sharp and VB.NET and later F Sharp. Then Miguel started another project called Xamarin. This was an attempt at making a cross-platform UI framework based on XAML. So XAML was a standard which adds functionality to XML and can be used to describe a user interface. Miguel and his team decided to try and make a single framework which would allow you to write your user interface in XAML and have it cross-compiled at build time to the native format of your target. As an example, you can have a Xamarin project which contains multiple XAML files, each representing a different slice of the UI for both Android and iOS. And at build time, Xamarin would take the XAML and the C-sharp code that you'd written and produce a binary for Android and a binary for iOS. And then you have one code base to rule them all make one change, recompile for both formats. And that was really cool. It used .NET Framework, if you were building on Windows, or Mono, if you weren't, on the back end. And you would have an app built specifically for Android or iOS, but from the same code base. If you're unaware, iOS uses Objective-C and Swift, whereas Android uses Java. So having that ability to cross-compile a single code base from both of those formats was amazing. Then, of course, along came Satya Nadella. Satya Nadella essentially started Microsoft's big push towards cloud computing, especially through the Azure platform. In 2013, when Steve Ballmer announced that he was retiring from Microsoft, Bill Gates set up a committee to pick the next CEO of Microsoft, and they chose Satya Nadella. And shortly after he became CEO, Microsoft started working closely with their competitors. I mean, who would forget the famous Microsoft Heart Linux slide? If you're not sure about what that slide is, check the show notes. When you think about it, a lot of Microsoft's past has been about closed source software. Some of it has been open source though. For instance, certain Microsoft partners were given access to the source code for the .NET framework. Microsoft created their own Linux distribution. Uh, It was called Sonic and it was based on Debian. And if that last one wasn't shocking enough to you, then you'll be beside yourself to find out that there are Microsoft employees who have committed source to the Linux kernel project. When Satya started working for Microsoft, he realized that the entire future of the company relied on the cloud. I mean, there will always be a large number of users who demand Windows on the desktop, but the future for apps and services, and especially the enterprise, is in the cloud. Ask almost any project manager what their application does, and they will invariably say, the cloud. They'll also say things like the blockchain and machine learning, or whatever the buzzword of the day is. In fact, it's become so ubiquitous that it's assumed that the application will run in the cloud anyway. So what Satya Nadella did was he redirected a lot of the engineering talent at Microsoft over to the cloud. 
he also decided that it would be a good idea to open source the .NET framework. As I said earlier, part of the .NET framework had already been open source to certain Microsoft partners, and this made sense because a lot of the NT kernel uses .NET framework code. The first part of the .NET framework to be open sourced was the dynamic language runtime, which provided, amongst other things, the dynamic keyword. This was actually open source before Satya Nadella became CEO. The DLR was announced in 2007, but was not released until 2010. There was an alpha in 2008, but it wasn't released proper until 2010. When the first stable version was released, it was adopted as is into the Mono project. So then everything started being more open, and the ASP.NET team started doing what they call community stand-ups. On September 2nd, 2014, Scott Hanselman, Scott Hunter, Damien Edwards, David Fowler, and John Galloway got together and did a live stream of what they were calling the ASP.NET Community Stand-Up Meeting. It was during this video that they introduced ASP.NET vNext. vNext was the codename for ASP.NET Core. During the meeting, they talked about all sorts of really cool things. Stuff which was still in development and a planning stage at that point too. Things like project.json, in place of the older csproj, although this would later be replaced in .NET Core 1.1 with a much simpler csproj. But the big thing that they wanted to push was Azure, and they even made a point of saying during this call, and I'll put a link to the call in the show notes, that the target platform for ASP.NET vNex was essentially Azure. And this was massive, because Azure had only really started picking up popularity a few years before. So the fact that Microsoft have gone all in with the cloud at that point tells you where they were then and where they still are heading today. At the time, the ASP.NET vNex team had introduced a thing called Kestrel. This was their next generation web server and was designed to replace HTTP.sys. In this first stand-up, which they all did sitting down, it was mentioned that Kestrel ran in LibUV, which was the cross-platform networking stack which is used by Node.js. The goal was to have c code talking directly to LibUV and that they were going to let the developers put Nginx or Apache or IIS in front of it. If you think about it, the .NET framework had always been a C++ technology. It was written in C++ for developers who were using C, C++, VB, .NET, C Sharp, and F Sharp, although support for that would come later. At this point, they had rewritten the entire thing in C Sharp, just like they had done with the compiler for the .NET languages, Rosalind, a few years prior. This gave them the ability to see where the C Sharp developer experience could be improved, specifically for .NET Core. One of those improvements is the modularity of .NET Core. It allows you to include just enough of .NET Core or ASP.NET Core in order to run your app. For instance, during that first meeting, Scott Hunter actually said these actual words. Um, But this isn't just about making you able to develop ASP.NET on a Mac. We're looking beyond that. Okay, so for now... Apps on Linux yeah. servers. That's, you that's you my, had it from App Boss. That's my goal is I want, to, I want you to be able to host your ASP.NET app on a Linux server as yep. easily as you can host it on a Windows server. He even went on to say that you could use Docker containers if you wanted. And that was huge. Just think about that. Docker had only just come out with its initial release date having happened in March 2013. So they were already looking at the different technologies that developers would want to leverage in order to host their ASP.NET Core apps on Linux servers. Shortly after that stand-up, .NET Core 1.0 was released to manufacturers. Uh, That's usually shortened to RTM. This means that the initial stable release was finally available. It was no longer an alpha, a beta, or a release candidate. It was the actual release that developers could start writing production applications with, and developers flocked to it. It didn't take long for us developers to start seeing the barriers to entry. The initial release of .NET Core didn't have full support for XML, and it definitely didn't have system.drawing. Most developers responded to Microsoft with, what can you do with this? We can't use this. It doesn't have the libraries that we need. Then Microsoft announced that they'd been working on a thing called the .NET standard. We'll cover this in greater detail in a later episode, but you can think of .NET standard as an interface, but in document form. It describes all of the APIs, classes, and types that a version of a platform within their .NET ecosystem must support. 
So, .NET Standard version 1.0 says that all platforms, .NET Framework, .NET Core, Xamarin, Mono, must support system.link and system.collections.generic, for instance. .NET Standard 2, with the Windows Compatibility Pack, gives developers access to system.drawing, but only if they're targeting Windows. A lot of developers asked, why should I port my application to .NET Core if it doesn't have all of these APIs? And the answer back from the community was along the lines of, well, take all of those methods which are .NET Framework specific, wrap them up in a microservice or a number of microservices and put them somewhere. Then you can re-implement your application stack in .NET Core, making it smaller and faster. This will allow you to adhere to solid principles much easier and allow you to only include the parts of the runtime that you actually need. You'd be able to host them on cheap Linux servers or even cheap Windows servers or whatever you want. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And that's what developers working on brownfield applications did. By rewriting parts of the applications and essentially using dependency inversion for the parts of the applications which required .NET Framework specific APIs, they were able to make their application smaller, faster, and cheaper to host. And as a result, we've seen a massive spike in ASP.NET Core applications and .NET Core applications. One key thing to remember if you take nothing else from this episode is that .NET Core and ASP.NET Core are two separate technologies. They have a similar relationship to each other as the one between .NET Framework and ASP.NET MVC, except that it's perfectly possible to run ASP.NET Core on a .NET Framework base. Uh, That's something that I call a Franken-hack. Anyway, since then, Microsoft have had a huge amount of support from the community, with people checking in features and bug fixes. This is because ASP.NET Core, .NET Core, EF Core, and SignalR are all open source. You can head over to GitHub and read through the entire source code for these projects. If you'll allow me a little hyperbole, can you imagine that? If you travel back in time to around 20 years ago and told Microsoft not to worry and that a large amount of their code would be open sourced within 20 years, they'd have called you crazy. Maybe not crazy, but they would have said it was impossible. So essentially, that's my brief history of the .NET framework, .NET Core, and how it all fits together. I would say that if you want a slightly more in-depth version of this history, you should head over to my blog at .netcore.caprogman.com. That's D-O-T-N-E-T-C-O-R-E dot caprogman.com. I have a post there called .NET Core History. I'll link it in the show notes. If you want more information about the history of .NET, I would take a look at a talk called The History of .NET by Richard Campbell, as he's putting together a book on the history of .NET. And that talk is essentially the highlights from that book. You should totally have a look at the GitHub repositories for .NET Core and EF Core and ASP.NET Core. As you can see, the literal history of the entire runtime and framework as it's being built up from the commits. And I'd always recommend that developers read source code written by other developers. Anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. My goal was to try and keep this one short and I've been talking at you for nearly 20 minutes so far. Hopefully you found this interesting. If you did, then let me know by sending me a tweet at .NET Core blog, D-O-T-N-E-T-C-O-R-E-B-L-O-G and head over to the website for this show, .NET Core dot show, D-O-T-N-E-T-C-O-R-E dot show and let me know what you think. Remember to check the show notes for a link to the full transcription of this episode which is available at .netcore.show. I'll see you again sometime soon. See you later, folks.